Well, greetings, test takers. This is Dean Tenney coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We've been working our way through uh, a series, <laughs> pun intended, your series in 60 minutes. Uh, we had people that were using the audio file and uh, videos the day before or morning of their exam. And uh, I had thought, well, gee, why not make uh, a 60 minute video where you could use it the uh, day before or morning of for uh, intellectual confirmation or inventory. It's not a learning tool just to kind of get you in the right circadian rhythm because most people don't wake up with a circadian rhythm of, you know, series nine, series four, series 24, whatever the case may be. So that's what this is for. It's not a teaching tool, you know, so if you find this uh, damaging to your psyche, then uh, don't do it. And if you're listening to this and it isn't the night before, or mining of your exam, we'll save it. And uh, I'll put something else in the uh, video description, a link to something you can watch a little sooner than that, or something in the uh, pinned comment that you can watch. Okay, so let's get started on your series in uh, 60 minutes. Okay, so types of accounts on your exam, right? Retail. You know, it's mainly about uh, protecting retail investors. You know, Joe Six Packs. We have less of a supervisory challenge if it's not a retail client, I think of a retail client, a living, breathing human being walking planet Earth. I think of institutional customers who are capable of protecting their own assets as not living, breathing human beings walking planet Earth. You know, banks, uh, savings and loans, mutual funds, uh, registered investment advisors, insurance companies, uh, partnerships. Uh, we also have accounts with fiduciaries. You know, fiduciary is a person who's legally uh, appointed and authorized to represent another, a third party. And in those accounts, we're going to need a copy of the trust agreement. And uh, appointment and authority would be verified by the registered option principle, Series 4, or a Series 9. Uh, discretionary authority, we have to be a little more careful on this as it relates to options. What I mean by that is, you know, if we're going to make a decision about action, asset, or amount, three A's, we need to have discretionary authority on the account. We don't need it for time and price. But in options, remember, the complete description is a little more involved than it would be for, you know, 10,000 shares of GE, right? Because the complete description of the option isn't the, you know, type. Type would be call and put. It wouldn't be the class. You know, it wouldn't be uh, IBM calls or Apple calls. That's the class. By the way, the position limits do apply to the class, the type plus the stock. The most complete description of the option is the series, right? Apple, November, December, uh, Apple, December, 140 calls. That's a complete description. So, you know, if I, as a supervisor or principal looking over the order ticket, it says, you know, opening purchase, 10 Apple, 140 calls, I go, well, where's the, uh, the month, the expiry? And, you know, rep says, well, gee, uh, okay, let's make it uh, September. I go, wait, do you have the authority to do that? Uh, I don't think so. Right? So a little uh, more careful as it relates to uh, options. And then remember, there's limited or full power of attorney or trading authorization for test purposes. I wouldn't worry about there isn't a distinction between that. But remember, it's limited power of attorney. Uh, all the rep can do is make investment decisions. If it's full power of attorney, that means the rep can not only make investment decisions, can also withdraw monies and securities. And that presents a bigger supervisory challenge, and we'd want to have heightened supervision. We want to supervise, you know, all discretionary accounts, but particularly those are full uh, power of attorney, uh, because that means, remember, they can withdraw monies and securities. Uh, those discretionary accounts have to be in, approved in written form. And as we said, a Series 4, Series 9 is going to have to review that uh, frequently. Uh, the customer is uh, going to have to have a written, receive a written explanation of uh, the strategy that we're using, using the discretionary authority. Now, I remember there's a type of order that is considered uh, not discretionary because I'm giving the third party, in this case, the floor broker. Remember, the floor broker executes orders for the clients of member firms on an agency basis. And one of the orders we can give a floor broker is not held. You know, buy 100 Apple, con uh, Apple December 140 calls at whatever time and price you think looks good. Now, that's giving the floor broker discretionary authority, a bad word, decision-making over time and price, and that does not constitute uh, taking discretion. 
Okay, so when we open an option account, what are we going to need on the new account form? We're going to need the customer's name, a tax ID number. We need a physical address on the original documentation. Now, after we have the original documentation, we will send things to a PO box. But on the original documentation, we're going to want a uh, physical address. We need a uh, phone number. Uh, we need to know your estimated net worth, your estimated liquid net worth, we need to know your marital status, the number of your dependents. We need to make sure your legal age, and therefore we're gonna ask for your date of birth. We need to know your investment experience and knowledge. You know, to, you know that's gonna help me as an ROP or sales supervisor decide whether you know the strategy is gonna, I'm gonna improve you for level one or two or three or whatever it might be. It's one of the data points for that. Um, the date the OCC disclosure document was delivered to the customer. That's very testable, the characteristics and risks of options. I'm going to ask my rep, did you deliver the OCC disclosure document, the characteristics and risks of options, and date that, because that's important, remember, because once uh, I approve the account to trade options, within 15 days, we need back the option agreement that says they've read that document and they understood it. So later on, you know, when they go backwards, we say, well, no, you told us that you read that and you understood it. Uh, their investment objective, the big one here would be the, the two types of players in the options market are going to be speculators, you know, people who are making a bet on the stock price. You know, again, this isn't a, a lecture on option strategies, but people are either buying or selling volatility on the stock, the stock. And then the other, you know, people players are coming are people trying to lay off a risk. Hedgers, they're trying to either generate additional income on a stock position, perhaps, or protect a stock position. And so it would be important to know, you know, what side of that they're on. Are they speculators, hedgers, both? And, you know, I can't tell you how many problems people run into when they tell us they're coming to hedge and then they end up, uh, you know, crossing over to being a, a speculator. Um, their employment uh, status, their estimated annual income from all sources, uh, the approval of the account, the records must show, show the source of the background and uh, financial information, the types of transaction in which the account we're gonna approve it for, the signature of the ROP, the registered option principal, series four, or the series nine sales supervisor for and the date of that approval. And unless it's for a, marginary, a margin or discretionary account, the customer doesn't have to sign the new account form. Now remember, your house requirement can always be more uh, stringent than any of the you know regulatory rules, and I think that's one of the challenges when you're taking a you know series nine, series four, twenty four, you know ten, is that you know you can have your mind clouded with what you already know is your house requirement. Sometimes it's easier for baby brokers who are tabla rasas because you know they'll believe anything we tell them. Anyways, um, the customer has to sign the uh, option agreement within uh, and return within fifteen days. And then remember, if the customer doesn't return that, all we're going to let them do is closing or offsetting transactions. So that means if they already have an existing long position, we'll let them do a closing sale. If they already have an existing short position, we'll let them do a closing purchase. Uh, we talked about that already. I just made some notes on things I'm trying to cover in these uh, your series and 60 minutes uh, videos. Again, I you don't have to look at my mug. I'm designing these. You know, the slide deck would, you know, get us jammed up on time constraints. So my expectation is you could be watching, you know, my mug, but uh, you could be using this as, uh, you know, the where, where this came, genesis of this was people are listening to these audio files, you know, to and from the test site. Well, I should say to the test site or commuting or whatever the case may be. Uncovered options. So uncovered options, remember, is where I'm agreeing to sell stock I don't own or I'm agreeing to buy stock and I don't have cash equal to the aggregate exercise price. So the uh, difference, for, it's different for every broker dealer, you know, what that approval would be. But we want to know your proper investment objective. For example, it makes a little more economic sense, perhaps, to tell me that you want to sell an uncovered put because you're still going to have a margin requirement. You still need a margin account. I mean, all opening sales, all short positions must be done in a margin account. The only exception to that would be an opening sale of a call contract on stock that you own, a covered call. But anyways, you might say, well, Dean, uh, my investment objective is I'm selling puts as an alternative to a limit order. 
you know, I'm selling the Apple 140 puts and I'm getting nine for that. And I, to be honest with you, Dean, it's in the money. I'm hoping somebody will exercise against me. I'll buy the Apple 140. I got nine. So I got the stock at less than the current market price, 131. Now, I can't tell you how many people say that. And then when it goes south on them, they, you know, they, they talk about it. We want to document again, whatever their investment objective is for doing the uh, uncovered option contract. Uh, again, we want them to know their trading experience because, you know, can't tell you how many people claim they have experience. They sound like they do. And then it starts going south and they start, you know, getting going backwards on me in terms of what they do understand. Uh, In-depth knowledge of option procedures, you know, exercise notices, for example, that if you're doing an uncovered option and it's American style, one of the risks you have is you might have to perform on the contract before the expiration date, for example. Uh, the proper uh, risk tolerance. And then again, uh, any documentation that we, you know, we want to really make sure we uh, document uh, uncovered options accounts that we're going to approve. Them. I know some firms that just don't. And then every firm uh, has different levels of option approval. Most of us work on a level one, level two, level three, level four, you know, and usually level one would be covered options. Uh, level two would be, you know, long options because, you know, those are pretty easy to qualify. Somebody wants to buy an option. Is this money you can afford to lose? And then if they do, we say, well, you told us that was okay, that you were good, cool with that. Level three would be some of the advanced strategies, you know, uh, spreads and straddles and uh, the ratio spreads, those kind of things, ratio rights. And level four would typically be uncovered. Now, not so much can you as a test issue determine a level of approval. No, no, no. But understanding that it, uh, as a sales supervisor, uh, nine or four, that uh, you know the customer understands that level of approval when he doesn't, he or the rep don't exceed that. Uh, Anti money laundering, you should be able to recognize the three stages of money laundering. Those three stages are placement. I got to have a place to put my dirty money. Uh, layering, that's where I mix my dirty money with my clean money. And if I'm successful, I've arrived as a money launderer to integration, where you can't tell my dirty money. Uh, from my clean money. I would know the Bank Secrecy Act is what gives the broker dealer the authority to share your information with FinCEN. FinCEN is where we're going to send CTRs, currency transaction reports, and it's where we're going to send uh, suspicious activity reports. Now, if it's a currency transaction report, that's going to be for more than $10,000 in a single day. And we're going to file Form 112 within 15 days of the receipt. Uh, I'd have a general understanding of the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is where we got to make sure we have proper customer identification procedures, that we can verify your identity, and we're going to check it against the Office of Foreign Asset Control to make sure you're not a restricted person, you know, that you haven't had any um, uh, uh, restrictions placed on you, you know, as, as a Russian oligarch or something like that. Uh, so we have to verify your identify identity. We maintain the the records, and we check any list of uh, known or suspected uh, terrorists. You know those kind of people. People on that OFAC list. Uh, I told you customer identification requires a picture ID. We need your name, your date of birth, your address again, physical address on the original documentation, and some kind of a tax ID number. Uh, suspicious activity reports would be that uh, for five thousand or more. And we're going to file uh, to FinCEN Form 111 within 30 days. So, you know, and I would know, uh, have a general understanding of red flags, like it's commercially logical, uh, source of the funds, uh, you know, whatever yeah, it may uh, be involved. Now, as a Series 4 uh, principal, you can approve and review all new option accounts. You can review correspondence. You can approve options communications. Uh, you can approve advertising and sales literature. If you're Series 9, you cannot approve advertising and sales literature. So, you know, you might have to take another test. I always joke, once you're in this regulatory thing, you might, you know, just continue on and roll the table, so to speak. Uh, you can uh, approve uh, order tickets and trade uh, blotters. You can approve discretionary accounts. You can approve option worksheets. Uh, the templates are the templates. We'll talk about that, right? We don't rep, rep, want reps making up their own worksheets and illustrating covered calls, for example. We want to have a standardized template, and that would have to be approved by a Series 4. Series 9s would not approve that template because the template ends up getting sent out 
and it ends up going into the bucket of, uh, you know, retail communication. Anyways, uh, review customer uh, statements and confirmations. You know, you're trying to detect, detect, you know, any kind of a trading abuse like capping or pegging. You know, capping is trying to keep the stock from going up. So, you know, the calls will expire. You know, pegging is trying to keep the stock from falling below the strike. So the puts will expire. And, you know, you're reviewing just to kind of, you know, uh, try to detect uh, trading abuses. Uh, review um, transactions to compare with the investment objective. And all firms have to designate an AML officer. Surprising, the AML officer doesn't have to be a four or a 24 or have any kind of a registration. We could steal somebody from a bank, perhaps. I can't imagine we wouldn't get them registered, but the AML officer uh, does not have to be registered. Uh, series fours are required to review uh, discretionary trades, and that's true of nines as well, right? Discretionary uh, trades frequently uh, oversee uh, market making if we're trading on a proprietary basis. Uh, train uh, reps. If you're going to be training reps, you should be a nine or four. And uh, we have to have written supervisory procedures. And again, the written supervisory sub procedures would be done by, as it relates to options, a series four would oversee that, not a nine. Uh, customer suitability. Options are considered uh, speculative. Uh, you know, you know, we said there's either speculators or there's hedgers. And that would require, if you're going to speculate, having a higher net worth and income requirement. We have uh, three kinds of suitabilities. We have reasonable suitability, you know, given, for example, what we mean by the reasonable is, you know, writing covered calls to generate additional income on a stock position is considered uh, reasonable. So we don't have a client involved in that. It's, you know, the, based on the strategy itself. And that could be customer specific suitability where, you know, for this particular customer, I'm going to say it's okay. And then we have quantitative suitability where we use like, you know, artificial intelligence or algorithms to uh, recognize suitability or, you know, what we're really trying to do is kind of the opposite, recognize unsuitable trades. Institutional suitability, institutional uh, suitability is much easier. And what I mean by it's much easier is because remember where the assumption is that they're capable of protecting their own assets, their own assets. So it's less of a, a supervisory uh, issue because they're able to uh, make an, uh, their decisions on an independent basis. Uh, regulation, best interest. Any uh, member, you know, member firms of FINRA should uh, have or exercise reasonable diligence, care, and skill, acknowledge potential uh, risks, and we have to act in the best interest of the customer. You know, uh, the, the regulation BI is kind of trying to tilt the broker dealer towards not being legally a fiduciary, but having those same kind of responsibilities when acting in the best interest of a customer. And we have to have, you know, client relationship summary that, uh, you know, explains some of those conflicts of interest. Uh, best execution. Now, be careful on best execution. You know, I, I don't have to necessarily execute the trade at the best price. It's just in all, I have to make a reasonable basis. So, you know, it'd be reasonable if I don't do that. If, if I, for example, don't think the the person has the best price, is the person going to be here on T plus one if it's an option contract or T plus two if it's a, you know, exercise notice to make good on the contract. Now, in terms of counterparty risk on the exercise, the OCC would stand in the middle. I wouldn't have that risk, but uh, it's not that I have to go with the person who has the best price. So, All right, so option positions. As I said, we don't really care too much uh, as supervisors about a long option position because it's very easy to qualify somebody. Uh, you know, can they afford to lose the premium? Uh, but we also want to make sure that if they are going to exercise the contract, because there's three things that can happen to the option contract. T is a good way to reverse. The option contract can be traded, you know, uh, as a supervisor, registered option principal, I'm not concerned if we have enough money to do the offsetting transaction. Well, I should say I'm less concerned. The option can be exercised. Now, if you're long and you're exercising, I want to make sure you have the money to exercise, right? If you are long an Apple 140 call, I want to make sure that if you exercise, you're capable of coming up with uh, $14,000 or your margin account $7,000. Because, you know, I want to make sure you're not going to take a free ride that we're going to exercise the contract and then you can't pay on T plus two, right? And I sell you out and then you, you know, took a ride you didn't pay for, use broker dealer money. Uh, we'll end up freezing your account, but, you know, 
I'm more concerned uh, with short option positions, right? So I'm not as cons uh, concerned about whether it's a call buyer who, you know, is speculating on the stock price, you know, and they might be using it to defer a decision. For example, uh, you know, I want to buy this uh, stock at 20. It was 20 at the time I'm looking at it. Uh, but I'm afraid by the time I get the money, it's going to move away from me. And uh, I was looking at buying a thousand shares. That's $20,000. I didn't have the $20,000, but knew I would shortly. And so I uh, bought 10 of the 20 calls for two. That's $2,000. And that gives me a chance to defer the decision of buying the stock. In this case, I want to buy the stock, but who knows? Obviously, if the stock goes to 16, I go, woo, that was not such a good idea after all. <laughs> so I could uh, be using that to defer the decision, to diversify my holdings. And, uh, you know, a call writers we're more concerned with. You know, as a call writer, I'm agreeing to sell stock. Right. And, you know, I want to make sure there as a supervisor, you understand the consequences. You know, what Dean does is not testable, but I used to make every customer sign a happy letter if they're selling options. If they're selling a call covered or not, I'd say, will you please acknowledge that you understand that if you get exercised, you're going to be delivering the stock at less than the current market price. And if you're selling a put, will you acknowledge that you understand that if you get exercised on the put, you're going to be buying at a higher than the strike price? You know, and that way, when they claim they didn't know that, I whip out that big boy or big girl letter and say, here you go. You know, you said you understood it at the time. So uh, we're more concerned on exercise on people who are short than we are. So we said the option contact can be traded, not a major supervisory challenge there. It can be exercised. And there I'm very concerned with the people who are short. Expire, I'm not concerned because the losers there are the people who bought the contract. And remember, they told me that that was money they could afford to lose. So um, put buyers. Or speculating on a client now is a put buyer uh, you know i kind of as a supervisor register option principal think that's a pretty prudent thing to do as a bear you know i always say there are dumb bears and there are smart bears and a smart bear is somebody who might want to consider or be approved to buy puts rather than shorting the stock you know one reason you, you know and again as a rop or series nine i'm looking for customers and reps who can articulate to me what they're trying to do you know, I don't want them kind of making it up on the fly, so to speak. So they say what we're trying to do, Dean, is have less exposure, right? What I mean by less exposure is if you buy the put and you're wrong, you just lose your premium. But if you short the stock or do a naked call, then you have unlimited risk. So, you know, now you got to be right about three things. If you buy the option direction, uh, how far and timing, and you don't have to do that in the stock position, but oh, well. So it, my point is, this is an ROP series nine. Uh, I'm a fan of people who want to buy puts versus other speculative things they could do as a bear. Again, also uh, defers a decision. You know, I had uh, bought a 40 put with the idea that I would roll into a short stock position if the stock went down, right? So here I have a 40 put, I have a choice to sell. I don't have the stock. And, uh, you know, at expiration, the stock is 32. So I said, listen to my broker. Again, you want to know the order handling practices. I said, don't buy the stock and deliver at 40. I want to borrow stock. Don't buy and deliver. I want to borrow and deliver and roll into a short position. So I'm deferring the decision on the short position, kind of like the long in, the long position again. But here, uh, again, I wouldn't roll into the short position by exercising the 40 put at 32 if the stock wasn't you know below the strike. If it was you know 45 or 50, I'd say, ooh, thank God I bought that put and <laughs> didn't short the stock. Um, we said that put writers... Again, we can understand why somebody wouldn't want to write puts as a, a ROP, uh, registered option principal or sales supervisor. They might be writing the put again as an alternative to a limit order. You know, it's a way to get the stock at less than the market price. The way I think it is, you know, why not get paid to do something you're already prepared to do? Um, uh, they might want to marry a put to their stock position to protect against a big price decline, but still have the ability to participate in a big price increase. Don't get too, well, I guess it's too late because you're testing this afternoon or tomorrow, but, you know, I think a lot of people on, uh, you know, take the test, uh, get in the weeds on strategies, and it's more like kind of like what we're talking about. It's more situational, not are you an option, you know, expert, but do you have a general understanding of why people would deploy the strategy? Because, you know, again, how are you going to prove the account if you don't know what kind of strategies they're uh, pursuing? Uh, but that would be what we call an effective hedge. It works, you know. You have put in a floor at the strike price of the put. A covered call, sometimes we call a partial hedge. It kind of works. 
What I mean by kind of works is the floor is still zero. You're just closer to it. So, you know, as a, a supervisor, registered option principal, I prefer effective hedges, you know, people who have choices than I have, uh, than I do people who have uh, obligations. So a cover call is a partial hedge, whereas a married put is an effective hedge. Uh, boy, if you're short the stock, I would love you to buy a call contract. So, you know, my rep says that, uh, you know, the customer wants to buy calls on stocks he's short. I go, wow, that's a smart guy, right? That is a, a smart guy. By the way, if you think about it, you're not going to get asked about synthetics, but most similar to what I mean by that is, so I just gave you an example where we buy the stock and we buy a put and we have limited risk. You know, we, our protection kicks in at the strike. We have unlimited gain. So, you know, long the stock and long a put is the equivalent of a long call, a synthetic long call, same risk reward, All right? You can kind of do this. Uh, you know, you can mumble if, you know, you're testing today or tomorrow, you know, don't, don't bail too soon. If you just kind of, you know, mindset kind of think in your brain housing group, okay, what happens max gain, max loss, uh, break even, you'd be able to kind of, you know, get your, to this idea of synthetics or most similar to, I just gave you an example of a smart bear, somebody, a smart bear who's long the put, but also another smart bear would be a bear that is short the stock, but has an effective hedge through a long call. And so that is most similar to a long put, right? Uh, you know, on a long put, it's break even to zero. And short the stock, long the call, it's break even to zero, limited risk. And then you make money but going down. So don't bail too quick on those. Um, uh, ratio writing, be careful uh, uh, on the test uh, for a ratio, right? You don't need to identify it as a ratio, right? But make sure you understand that somebody who's selling more calls than stocks that they own. and there's no such thing as being partially naked. That would subject the investor uh, to unlimited risk. All right, so uh, margin. Uh, margin, remember, is controlled by the Federal Reserve Board in four stocks. Reg T says you have to initially be at risk for 50%. And then uh, minimum is set by the SRO, which is 25%. That's called minimum maintenance. And remember, the house requirement can always be more stringent than that. Uh, FINRA also has, remember, this uh, idea of a minimum of being $2,000. And the trick here, remember, is if you buy stock less than two, you're gonna pay in full. And if you're buying stock two to $4,000, you're going to uh, pay uh, two. Uh, I would know that uh, options for the most part are ineligible uh, securities for margin. And what that means is you can't borrow to purchase them and they can't you can't use them as collateral. Now, the exceptions to that would be a leap. You know, uh, leaps can be marginal under certain circumstances. Remember, leaps technically go out to 39 months and practice uh, 40 months. And that would be the exception. Uh, you're considered long. So, you know, I'm looking at the order ticket and you're selling this, uh, the call and you're considered long or covered if you have the stock. Uh, you have a long call. So what that would be is either a debit or a credit call spread. So if you're short the call and you have another call, so you have a choice to buy the stock. So you have an obligation to sell offset by a choice to buy. That's called a spread. Now there, the margin requirement is going to be the difference in the strikes because that's going to be your maximum loss, right? Or I should say, well, if it's, let me just, sorry about that. Uh, let's review. So if it's a credit call spread, I'm uh, selling the Apple 140 calls and I'm buying the 150s. So the worst case is I'm gonna buy the Apple 150, I have a choice to do that, deliver 140, I'm gonna lose 10. Now of the 10 I'm going to lose, the credit is already there. So be careful, the margin requirement in this case is that 10 points or $1,000. But part of that 10 points or $1,000 is already in your account. So let's say the net credit for that position was four. So it's a 140, uh, 150 credit call spread. The net credit was four. So what I want you to send in the margin call is gonna be six points or 600. That way the loss is already in there, right? So the margin requirement, but by the way, again, as a supervisor, registered operations principal, I love spreads because all the action takes place between the strikes. Now, on the other hand, if it's a debit of a four, it's a 
I'm buying the 140 Apple calls. I'm selling the 150s. And now it's a debit of four. All you need is the 400 points, uh, the four points that you could lose. So, you know, I think of it as the maximum loss, the difference in the strikes. So you need that that difference there. Uh, you uh, have a warrant that you've ex exercised, uh, issued exercise instructions, you'd be considered covered, right? So if you short a call and you own the stock or you short a call and you have a, a long call that offsets that. By the way, in the, my credit example, you still need a margin account. So, you know, be careful there. It's all short sales must be cut up to margin account. So even though that's a credit call spread, you're going to need a margin account and the debit spread, you're going to need a margin account as well. So I mean, the only time you're not going to need a margin account is if you're uh, you know, going to do an opening sale on a stock you own, if you're doing the multiple option strategy. All right. So uh, there's an escrow. You give me a bank a escrow that says they have that stock and they'll deliver it if uh, exercised. A convertible, and you've uh, again exercise issued exercise, you know that you want to convert it into the stock, and a a bank guarantee letter that tells me you're good for it. You know they they will you know make sure that there's not going to be any problem. Uh, the initial margin requirement. So if you know you sell the Apple 140 calls uncovered naked, uh, it's going to be 20 percent of the market value, right? 100% of the option premium plus 20% of the market value, less the out of the money amount. That makes sense when you think of it because out of the money means it's unlikely to get exercised. Now, in most uh, exams, you know, you're not going to have to do practical application. They're just going to have to recognize it. The premium, 20% of the market value, less the out of the money amount. And again, uh, let's say Apple's trading at 140, you know, 20%, let's say it's 10 contracts, that's 140 grand. So it'd be 28,000. And again, that would be another plus the premium you know, less the out of money. Anyways, what I was going to say is that uh, I'm just illustrating there. That's another reason you want to do a spread, right? If you do a spread, you know, we sell the 140s by the 150s, that number becomes a lot uh, less. Now, minimum on the option is going to be 100% of the current option premium. Again, it makes sense so that we can do the offset and 10% of whatever the market value is. Now, if you're a special, uh, uh, you're a day trader, pattern day trader, remember a pattern day trader means you do four or more trades in a five uh, business day period. You have to maintain $25,000 in equity. And we don't allow cross guarantees. We don't allow customer A to guarantee the uh, debit balance of customer B. Uh, customer complaints, we always advise the home office. Uh, we report uh, certain complaints to FINRA. So we report uh, FINRA. We usually report quarterly unless it's uh, something like, you know, fraudulent, uh, fraudulent conversion where somebody's, you know, trying to abscond or, uh, uh, take customer monies or securities. Uh, if uh, there is a complaint, depending on what kind of complaint, it might require an amendment to the U4. Uh, options require, uh, option complaints require a separate options complaint file and a separate log or index of those complaints. The central file must be in the principal place of business and include the identification uh, of the complainant, the person who's making the complaint, the identity of the broker servicing the account, a description of the matter complained about, and a record of what action was taken. So, you know, we hope we're going to be able to solve this to the customer's satisfaction. A customer of the complaint must be kept as, as well in the branch office as well as the, uh, you know, principal office. The OSJ is typically what we're talking about there. So all, all complaints, uh, no later than 30 days, it must be forwarded to the home office compliance. Uh, four years. Complaints are the one of kind of funky records that are four years. The vast majority of brokerage from records are two, but complaints are uh, four. If it's a complaint uh, that is uh, something that has time is of the essence, like I brought up like fraudulent conversion, something that, uh, you know, we need to can't take place in the normal, normal course of our business, that will require being sent to FINRA within 15 days of each calendar quarter. But as I said, if it's something that is time is of the essence, like theft, embezzlement, or forgery, 30 calendar days from the complaint. So typically we file quarterly within 15 days, unless it's uh, something where time is of the essence, like alleging theft or embezzlement or forgery, then it'll be uh, 30 calendar days uh, from uh, for the complaint uh, that we forwarded to FINRA. Uh, cancel and rebail orders. A lot of shenanigans take place in the uh, cancel and with cancel and rebills and what we call the error account. So uh, minor changes 
uh, in a trade would generate a cancel and rebill. And it's a, a position from a cash account, for example, to a margin account, a transaction posted to the wrong customer account. And then you know, the error account is where we hold the errors. You know, that's why it's called the error account. Uh, common errors are errors in reporting or errors in execution or errors in posting. And a principal uh, must monitor the error account continuously. Just make again sure there's no shenanigans going on. And all those reports uh, must be made in written form and they're retained three years. I mean, the vast majority of brokerage firm records are three years. If uh, it's a market center and, you know, we need to notify the market center if we think there's some uh, irregularity. If it's customer in order, 30 minutes uh, to notify the market center. And if it's a non-customer order within uh, 15 minutes to notify uh, the market uh, center. Uh, long option positions. Um, you know, if we have uh, positions of 200 contracts, so somebody owns more than uh, 200 contracts, long option position reporting, uh, we're going to want to uh, report those uh, positions. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much. I think that's a very low probability, but position limits are very testable and they don't, you typically test you on the position limits. They'll say assuming position limits are because the position limits based on the float in the stock. But I would know that it's based on the same side of the market, the same side of the market. And uh, that means long calls, short puts. This, that's the buy side or bullish side of the options market or short calls and long puts. That's the bearish or sell side of the options market. And then remember, it applies to the type plus the class. Apple calls is a class. Apple puts is a class. And then uh, be, be careful for the phraseology uh, acting in concert. So if they give you a question on position limits and they say husband and wife acting in concert, we always would consider the husband and wife to be co-conspirators, one party for purposes of applying the position limits. So and be careful when you're looking for that acting in concert, acting in concert. Uh, some trading abuses that you should be aware of. Uh, we talked about some of these already, but unauthorized trading uh, making trades without the customer's uh, permission. Uh, capping, you know, that's where we sell the stock to keep it from going up above the strike. Uh, pegging, that's where we uh, buy the stock to keep it from going down, right? Front running, big no-no, trading ahead of customers. A uh, trade through is, again, um, a trade that's through the highest bid or the lowest ask. Now, be careful on a trade through that may or may not you know, be a, a prohibition depending on the circumstances. What I mean, it might be volume. It could be, there could be reasons that I have a trade through and, you know, I just want to make doc, document. Uh, marking the close, a big no-no, trying to generate my own uh, uptick at the close or generate uh, marking the opening. Both are big, uh, big no-nos. Uh, mismarking the ticket, big one, right? So unsolicited versus solicited. So, you know, I call on the broker. I say, listen, I'm looking at these order tickets. 10 of these customers all had the same idea at the same time. And, and you did this uh, in your account first, really? And you say, oh, Dean, I'm just trying to keep us out of trouble. Well, no, don't do us any favors. If, you know, don't mismark a ticket unsolicited if it was solicited. Uh, regulation show, remember, uh, it says in short sales, we have a locate requirement. Uh, and the threshold securities uh, have failed to deliver or, you know, we have however many consecutive days, we would have to, uh, you know, buy that in. Again, that's more of a, a 10 24 thing than 9 4 thing. Uh, just like I say, just reviewing the things that I, these 60 minute uh, series things are kind of challenging about what we're going to decide to, to discuss. Uh, uh, well, we talked about this a little bit. And what I mean by that is we talked about this idea of solicited and unsolicited. But remember, there's another idea here on the order ticket as well, and that would be discretion exercised or discretion not exercised, right? So, you know, discretion exercise means, you know, I use my discretionary authority, but I might call you up and say, hey, I'm uncomfortable using my discretionary authority in this example. So I'd like to run it by you in this situation. And you say, okay, let's do it. That's solicited, that's solicited discretion not exercised. Oh, uh, contrary exercise advice. So 
you know, we have automatic exercise in your option agreement. We tell you that we haven't heard from you and you're long. We would assume that you would want us to exercise the uh, contracts for you. And so you say, no, I don't want that to be out of, done. So the contrary exercise advice instructs, instructs the options clearing corporation not to automatically exercise by the deadline of 5.30 p.m. Eastern time on the day of expiration. Uh, the deadline is 90 minutes after the close on the options. Advice cancel. So this is where you want to cancel the contrary uh, exercise uh, advice. You do that by the deadline for that would be 5.30 Eastern time on the day of uh, expiration. And again, the deadline is 90 uh, minutes after the close of the options. Uh, stock splits, reverse splits, and stock dividends. You know, one thing to uh, keep in mind is that whatever the value, the cash, you know, the aggregate exercise price, that's not going to change. Now, again, this is your series in 60 minutes. I'm not going to go into a bunch of examples of, you know, how to adjust option contracts, you know, for in the uh, stock splits, a reverse split or a dividend. But if you're trying to muddle your way through, now, if you get this, if, you know, if you tell me you missed Mark because of this, I'm not going to believe you. But if you know, you stick with it and say, okay, let me go through these answers. And the one that I'm going to look for, this alone will get you a 50-50, is just to remember if it was like uh, an Apple uh, 140 call and there's a two-for-one split, the $14,000 does not change. So you could use the multiplier to kind of say, okay, what one is still $14,000? A two-for-one split, those are kind of easy because you can almost eyeball them, right? It's two contracts at, uh, at 70. Uh, assignments and settlements. So very testable. Remember the OCC assigns exercise notices on a random uh, basis. And then remember your firm can do that random five, four, another fair method. Now as the firm, you can't be making that up on the fly. It can't be discriminatory. You can't say, Oh, there's that jerk. Let's get him. Or there's my good customer. I don't want to do it to him. Whatever your firm is using, you have to tell the options clearing corporation you have to inform your customers and you go to change it. Again, you would have to tell uh, the OCC and your customers, you can't just be changing this around. So the changes when you do that is going to require the pre-approval of the exchange and uh, customer uh, notification, pre-notification to the customer. We tell them before we make that change, if we're going from example, from random to FIFO or whatever the case may be. Uh, most firms using random just because it's easier uh, to do that. Uh, remember, uh, if you get exercise, remember American style means uh, you, the holder could exercise any time they want. Now, remember the option contract is T plus one, but the resulting stock trade is T plus two. And remember, there is a distinction between index options. Index options, both the option and the exercise are T plus one. And in an index, you don't deliver the underlying like you do if it's a stock where you have to deliver the stock. You deliver the cash equal to the cash uh, value. All right, so we said there are three uh, buckets of uh, communications. There's uh, correspondence is one bucket, the other bucket is retail communications, and the other bucket is institutional communication. We don't really care about institutional communication again. The reason we don't care is because institutional customers are uh, not a supervisory challenge. Uh, but it's considered correspondence, remember, if it's uh, written to uh, email, by the way, the, there's no distinction between whether it's snail mail or email, to 25 or fewer retail uh, investors or prospects, right? This is what we mean by retail investors doesn't have to be necessarily be a client, within 30 days. So 25 or fewer, 30 days. That does not require uh, pr principal approval uh, pre-distribution. Where if it's a retail communication, uh, by the way, this is uh, an area where, you know, there's a distinction, retail communication between fours and nines, right? Uh, retail communication uh, would be to uh, more than 25 retail investors within a 30-day calendar period, and that does require pre-approval, pre-distribution approval by a registered option principal. So series four, not series nine. Okay, as I said, we don't really care about institutional communication, but be careful. A you know, like a research report is retail communication, 
And it doesn't matter if the research report is going to institutional customers, it's still in that basket. So just be careful of, you know, a, a tricky question, perhaps where, you know, you, you, they try and get you to change the status of something based on who it's sent. And then remember, if it is a institutional communication, but we think it's going to fall into the uh, hands of a retail customer, that would change that status. Uh, options worksheets. So remember, firms have to have a standard form for options worksheets. This is to illustrate hypothetical option transactions like a covered call, for example. Uh, Non-standardized worksheets are not uh, uh, permitted. What we mean by that is we don't want every rep coming up with their version of a worksheet. You know, we want to have a standard template that reps are using to illustrate option uh, strategies. A uh, completed worksheet, once it's completed, does not require an ROP's pre-approval. Remember, the pre-approval for the ROP is based on the template. Uh, there's many types of uh, disclosures. Uh, we disclose, you know, then we, these are just general disclosures, um, you know, about making sure, you know, the, the uh, that this is a date on the worksheet saying this as a, as of, because, you know, the options may change. Um, there's also disclosures that the broker dealer is going to make. Uh, the two big ones that I would be aware of is broker check. There has to be a link on the uh, broker website to broker check. And then there also has to be uh, a link either to the business continuity plan. If it's not a link that gives it to you, it tells you how to get it. Again, I'm just uh, checking the things I wanted to talk to you about in your 60 minutes, your series in 60 minutes. Uh, I, I basically told you about spreads. I wouldn't get in the weeds on strategies on spreads, but mainly why we, we like them, right? So we have debit call spreads, which are bullish. That's where you buy the lower strike, you sell a call with the higher strike, and it creates a debit in your account. And we said the margin requirement is that debit. The max gain is the difference in the strikes less the debit, and your loss is the debit itself. So again, I like it because what you've done in a debit call spread is lower your out-of-pocket costs, therefore lowering your risk, and I'm all about that. And then by doing that, you've lowered your uh, volatility you need to break even. And again, I'm a big friend, of, as a supervisor, nine or four, I'm a big fan of credit call spread. So at a credit call spread, we're selling the call with a lower strike and we're putting in a ceiling. That's the way I think of it is floors and ceilings. I love positions where there's a floor and a ceiling. You know, the floor would be the lower strike and the ceiling is the higher strike. And so there the uh, creates a credit in your account. The maximum gain is when the contracts expire, neener, 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 you keep the money. And the maximum loss, and this is what I love because it's bearish, uh, rather than being a naked call, your maximum loss is going to be the difference in the strikes less the credit. Now, remember the margin requirement for the credit spread is the difference in the strikes. And then the margin call is going to be the difference between the credit and the remainder. What I mean by that, if in my example of Apple 140, 150 call, the net was four. Four is in the account, send me six. We'll call it a day. Uh, debit put spread, we buy the put with the higher strike. Sell the put with the lower strike. Again, I like it because it lowers your out-of-pocket cost on the long puts. So now you have a debit put spread. And again, your max loss is going to be the debit. The max gain is the difference in the strikes, less that net debit. And your maximum loss is again, what you paid for the spread. And again, the margin requirement would just be the spread. So, you know, we love it. We have a vertical spreads. A vertical spread or price spread is when the strike prices are different. We have horizontal spreads where the time, it also known as a timer counter spread. Now that one be a little careful on which one of in the horizontal or time spread the customer is long or short. Because remember, if he's short, the longer term option, he can end up with a short position, right? Because, you know, we're going to have the, the long thing expire first. So just, you know, pay attention to that. Uh, uh, we have diagonal spreads where both the month and the strikes are different. So in a horizontal or time spread, the expirations are different. And again, uh, the only thing I would add to this idea of not so much identifying as horizontal or diagonal is just making sure you check quickly to see that uh, you know you're not short the longer term option. Uh, specialized orders you can call in or enter orders as a uh, net debit or net credit, right? Uh, once you have these, uh, you can uh, you know uh, uh, you know roll forward or roll out whatever the case may be. So uh, let's talk about a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about the differences between what nines and tens can do. So reviewing correspondence, both nines and fours can review correspondence. 
Approve communications, very testable. Fours can, nines cannot. Approve advertising and sales literature, fours can, nines cannot. Approve discretionary accounts, fours yes, nines yes, both can approve discretionary accounts. Uh, train options representatives, that should be a four and not a nine that is training a registered, uh, you know, the uh, reps. Uh, written supervisory procedures, you know, the one who's in charge of writing those things for options, that would be a four and not a nine. Uh, uh, supervise, oversee market makers. So if we are trading on a proprietary basis, option contracts, that can be supervised by a four, but not a nine. So, you know, we're kind of handing nines that you might have to come back and take a four at some point, right? Um, review uh, transactions. Uh, for investment objective suitability, both would do that. Uh, that's both a, a, a four and a nine. Uh, designate an AML compliance officer. That's a principal that would appoint an AML officer, not a nine. Uh, review customer uh, transactions and confirms. Uh, both nines and fours can do that. Uh, review order tickets, both nines and fours can do that. And review uh, commissions and cost. Uh, of options, you know, the, sometimes we send people happy letters saying, do you understand options can create significant commissions and both can review that. Uh, we have some sophisticated option strategies and we talked about some of those sophisticated option strategies. Now they typically on your exam, they don't use the word synthetic. They use the word most similar to, right? So, you know, what's most similar to a synthetic put, right? A synthetic long put, as we said, would be short the stock and long the call, right? So the break-even gains and losses are similar. I have a little video too late for you now, but maybe I'll, I'll link that because we're not supposed to be watching this if you're not testing uh, tomorrow or this afternoon. A synthetic call, right? So if you are long the stock with long a put, again, you have limited risk, unlimited reward, you're bullish. The rumor call would be strike price plus, and the break even is going to be stock cost plus. So the synthetic call would be uh, long the stock and long the put. A synthetic stock position. You know, if you're long a call and short a put, that ends up being the same risk reward of being long the stock. Uh, synthetic short stock. I don't know why in the world you would want to do that, but just recognize that a short call and short the stock short the put isn't effectively hedged and you still on both of those are going to have unlimited risk uh straddles remember we have long straddles and short straddles and again we have no supervisory challenge with a long straddle what i mean by that is is this money you can afford to uh lose this is a multiple options transaction where you go long a call and long a put or short a call and short a put if there are different strike prices it's not called a straddle it's called a combination and uh it's all you know well, i shouldn't say that it has two break-evens, right? It has an upside break-even and it has a short side, a downside break-even. So in the uh, long straddle, uh, the uh, maximum gain is unlimited because of the long call. Your maximum loss is the uh, premiums. Short straddles would be two short positions. And we, we worry about this one because these are very seductive. Do you think the stock's going to stay between, you know, whatever and whatever, but if it goes outside the break-even, you have unlimited loss potential. So I would certainly know that short straddles and short combinations, and that's a straddle of different strike prices, have unlimited loss potential. A uh, long combination, you just lose the premium again. And a pretty easy supervisory thing is this money you can afford to lose. Uh, we have uh, strangles. A strangle is an out of the money put and an out of money call with the same expiration date. And uh, long strangles, we're expecting a sharp movement in the stock price. Uh, short strangle, we're expecting a stable market on the stock price. Again, very, very similar to, you know, straddle in terms of what we're expecting. Uh, the gains in the Blake, even, like I said, it's just a straddle with different, you know, out, the, with, out of the money, you know, contracts. Uh, ratio call spreads, be careful on that. Remember, ratio call spread, the thing to be aware of on your exam tomorrow or this afternoon is just make sure you understand there's no such thing as partially naked. A uh, butterfly spread. A butterfly split is three evenly spaced strike prices of calls and puts. I don't know if it's helpful. I think of it as two spreads or a long straddle outside a short straddle, but uh, there's both limited risk and limited profit. 
Uh, the break-evens are calculated by adding the net premium to the lowest strike price and subtracting the net premium from the higher strike price. Again, if you're testing tomorrow or you're testing uh, this afternoon, you know, too late, what did I tell you? I, if you're cheating and you're watching this before your exam, I have a butterfly, butterfly spread video that you can watch. Uh, it's in the Series 4 playlist. I don't think I put in the Series 9 playlist because I didn't think it was a big a deal for a 9. Uh, long butterfly spread, the maximum profit is realized at the strike price of your short calls. Uh, the middle strikes are called the body. If I showed you a picture, you know, in the, in the thumbnail for that lecture, right, there's a picture of a butterfly where it shows you the, uh, the body of the butterfly. Um, the higher and lower strikes are called the wings. And if you buy the wings, you're buying the butterfly. Uh, flex options, kind of cool. Flex options can be American or European customized options. Uh, the expiration date, strike price, exercise style are negotiated between buyers and sellers. The expiration can be up to 15 years. Wow. They're like the over-the-counter options because liquidity is a concern. What we mean by that is there's not a lot of open interest. Uh, market indexes. We have two types of market index options. We have broad-based, the S&P uh, 500, for example. We have narrow-based. Uh, narrow-based are nine or fewer stocks. Uh, VIX, we have contracts on the Volatility index, known as the VIX. I would definitely know the volatility, uh, the VIX, is based on the S&P 500 index. And there are no position or exercise limits on the VIX. Uh, they trade from 9.30 to 4.15 Eastern time after the S&P opens. Again, be careful here, too. We don't do opening rotations on options unless the stock is you know, open, or in this case, the index is open. I, I joke, we don't let you bet on the horses that are not running around the track. Um, the, uh, as I just said, I think, oh, the uh, last day to trade the VIX options each month is the Tuesday uh, prior to the Wednesday. Uh, we have foreign currency options. They're typically European style. Uh, they can, we can speculate on the movement of currencies or we can use them to hedge. You know, good thing to remember, it's the same as your seven is epic. U.S. exporters buy puts, U.S. importers buy calls. I'm not being facetious. The U.S. dollar is not a foreign currency. The U.S. dollar is not a foreign currency. So stay focused on the foreign currency. Um, 600,000 is the position limit, and it's uh, 1.2 for the euros. Uh, very low probability. Uh, general options activity, uh, listed options cease trading at 4 Eastern time. The latest you can exercise is 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. The option expires, uh, options expire uh, at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time on the third Friday. Uh, cabinet trades, you know, a lot of accounts don't understand this idea of options expiring worthless. So if the customer would like, we'll generate a cabinet trade for them, you know, for a dollar per contract or less than a penny, uh, you know, the dollar per contract, so we're going to close it out or less than a penny. I wouldn't worry about that. But the point is so we can show an offsetting trade uh, you know, to the uh, option that expired. Uh, fast market is declared by the exchange or the trading floor officials. And that's when we have extremely high volume uh, and volatility. And the crows can be inaccurate and the filling orders can be difficult. And we will allow people who are not registered to help out. Uh, trading halts. Uh, I would know level one halt is 7% decline in the S&P 500. If that takes place bef before 3.25 PM, it's 15 minutes. Uh, if it takes place uh, after 325, we will uh, continue, right? So we can, trading will continue unless there's a level three halt. So it means we're going to finish up the day is what that means in English. Level two halt is 13% decline. If again, before 325 p.m., it's a 15-minute halt. If after 325, we suck it up, we finish out the day. Level three is 20%. We say, let's not get stupid. Let's take a strategic pause and, uh, you know, maybe tomorrow will be better. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't worry about uh, tax too much on, on your exam, but uh, when you exercise a call, your cost basis is the strike price plus the premium. For the most part, it follows break-evens. Uh, tax sale uh, basis is the strike price plus the premium received. Uh, put options, the tax cost basis, strike price less premium. Again, for the most part, it follows break-evens. Uh, wash sale, if you take a loss and you reestablish position within 30, 30 days, uh, you're gonna, they're going to disallow the loss. So you have to be on the other side of that. So wash sale, 
is designed to prevent prevent you from taking loss and then reestablishing the position. So can't repurchase it within 30 days. All right, some uh, just uh, some things to finish up our 60 minutes. Uh, orders for spreads and straddles can be entered as market orders or limit orders. Uh, for limit orders, you must specify the maximum net net debit or net credit. Remember, the option premium always consists of two things, the intrinsic value and time value. As a supervisor or registered option principal, I don't really care about time value because it erodes. I worry about options that have intrinsic value because remember, I'm concerned when options get exercised. So, you know, that I'm trying to give you kind of the prejudicial kind of viewpoint you want as uh, on your exam. What I'm hinting is don't start putting in the comment box how you disagree with Dean on what I just said. Uh, let's see. The out of the money option always equals the time value. There's because there's no intrinsic value. Uh, a customer doesn't have to sign the new account form unless it's a margin account. Remember the series nine or ROP are the ones who sign the new account form. Uh, the OCC, remember, uses a random exercise. If the customer is buying or selling as part of a spread, uh, both option transactions uh, have to be done in a margin account. As we said, you have to have margin account to short options. The order ticket for execution for an air account is marked F for the firm opening or closing and an air account in the firm account, not a customer account. Uh, what we're saying is the air account is, you know, us doing cancels and doing things. Uh, every discretionary order must be marked discretionary and frequently reviewed by the uh, nine or four. A retail investor means any person other than an institutional investor. If we have any reps under heightened supervision, then again, we have to do a, have a separate kind of standard for monitoring uh, those folks. Uh, remember, debit spreads are profitable when the difference in the spread widens. Uh, opening rotation for the options, this is very testable, commences only at the underlying equity or index begins trading. So high probability. Uh, again, it, the other version of this was we halt trading. And if we halt trading, same deal. We'll halt the trading in the options. You could still exercise. Uh, floor brokers, as we said, act as agents uh, for the account of others, the customers of the broker dealer. Uh, dealers trade for their own account or the firm's account. They're trading on a prepared, proprietary basis. This is key for muddling your way through. So important. Remember, for all adjustments, for all adjustments, even an uneven reverse split stock dividends, the total position value is the same before and after the split. That'll help you muddle your way to the uh, right answer. Uh, last day, remember the trade, the VIX, is uh, the Tuesday prior to the Wednesday uh, expiration date. Brokerage firms usually establish uh, earlier cutoff times. Remember, house requirements can always be more stringent. If a short call is covered, there is no reg T for the option. Remember, you're not going to have to come up with the 20%. You're just going to have to come up with the margin requirement for the stock. If the exchange has uh, not rejected a retail communication, uh, the communication does not need to uh, be filed with FINRA. Uh, all statements for option customers must include a legend requesting the customer promptly inform us of any material change. Uh, there's my egg timer saying it's 60 minutes. So uh, we're pretty close. I got a couple more things I wanna say here before I call it a day. Uh, any party in the joint account who has trading authority binds all the parties. So I, I warned you about this phraseology acting in concert. Even if we don't say the phraseology acting in concert, husbands and wives are always considered to be acting in concert. Uh, uh, customer, we said, doesn't have to sign the new account form unless it's a margin account. We said, remember, the Series 4 or Series 9 does that, must sign the new account. And then remember, we said, last thing, just to remind you, we said if the customer hasn't returned the option agreement within 15 days of account approval, we're only going to allow uh, closing transactions. Okay, so inch by inch, your exam is a cinch. Yard by yard, it's hard. I'm sending you some good testing vibes. And uh, this will conclude our series, uh, your series in 60 minutes. <laughs> Hope you're finding them helpful. And uh, like I say, I still have content on my channel for series fours and series nines and 24s and 10s. And there's not you know many views in it for me. Uh, because there's not as many of you men and women that are doing those. But uh, I do appreciate the referrals to the channel. We're coming up on a million views. And I'm certain that 
the rapid growth of we're coming up on two years has been a direct result of uh, you folks, supervisors and principals uh, referring uh, some of your people starting their testing journey, SIE or their seven or their 66 or 65 or 63s to my channel and your referrals are certainly appreciated. Thank you very much and good luck on your exam. Bye-bye.